Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the South Florida Gospel News. I am your faithful host, Deborah Hall McCullen, and I am live in the studio today with a special studio guest. We're going to be talking about mental health, a very important topic that all of us can get involved in. Remember, if you want to make comments or ask questions, please uh, feel free to do so. Uh, if you want your name to show, give StreamYard your permission and your name will show up. So without further ado, while we're getting started and people start coming in, I'm going to bring in our special guest who is a mental health professional, and we're going to get started talking about mental health. Okay. So everyone, please help me welcome my special guest. Miss Kaylee Faulkner. Yay. Hello. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Well, good I'm afternoon. Gonna... Well, listen at me. Oh, I, right. Look, I was going to follow right along with you. <laughs> <laughs> good afternoon. I'm so excited to have you um, to come on to talk about a, a, a subject that's kind of taboo with people, especially in the Black community for some right. reason and in, in, in Black families. And so I want to uh, let you introduce yourself, tell us who you are, uh, a little bit about your background and how you uh, got started working as a mental health professional. Okay. Hello. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is, like you said, Kayleen. And, um, you know, mental health, uh, unbeknownst to me, um, really has always been a part of my life. And I'll I'll get into how that really came um, to be um, throughout, you know, here uh, online. But I didn't want to always be a mental health professional. Uh, so it came through some life experiences and, and things later on. Um, I joined the military some years ago in 2002, to be exact. Um, but when I was thinking about during that period of my life, kind of like what to do with my life um, during that time, you know, I've noticed that a lot of recruits and things were in the area. I remember high school recruits being in the area. Um, one thing that really stood out to me is that really clicked that they were going to impoverished areas mainly, um, disproportionately so. And so when at that time in my life, I was going through some things and I was thinking, wait a minute, kind of clicked. That's me. I, I'm in this area, you know, I'm struggling to make ends meet. I'm having a very difficult time. And so I don't say that in a, a demeaning way that they, they went to these areas, but they did so because they knew these areas, people needed to get out. They needed more resources, you know, they needed something more. And so again, I was like, wait a minute, that's me. Why am I, um, trying to make it work in an area where it's really almost impossible to, to live, you know, to have a, a livable wage. And so that's when I decided to to join the military and, and so really where it took off. Was, was it all branches of the military that visited your school or one particular branch that came by? No, it was, it was all branches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but the one that stood out to me was uh, the army because at that time I really didn't know much about the military. I mean, my dad, he was in the, the Air Force, but he didn't really talk about it. So I really didn't know much about it. Um, and I picked the Army. It just seemed, you know, they're more foot on ground type. I didn't really want to do airplanes. You know, at that time, I was really ignorant to, to what the military was. So I didn't want to do airplanes. I didn't want to um, um, be on a boat or a ship. So I thought about the Marines because I really loved the uniform. I'm like, oh. Yeah, cute uniform type thing. <laughs> but uh, talking to my dad at the time, he really pushed against it. So um, for the Marines, for, for women. And so I, I that's when I uh, joined the Army because I realized that I need to make a difference for myself first in order to make a difference for others. I've always been that person who, I didn't call it social work. I didn't call it mental health work at the time. But I like always had that in me where I wanted to, to make a difference for others. Okay, very good. So uh, once you joined the military, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that that was um, 
a profession that you pursued while you're in the military? And then also how long uh, were you in the military? Yeah. Well, it, it wasn't a prof profession I started out pursuing. I went in um, for administration. So some people still don't realize, I still get the questions of, oh, what did you do? Fight every day? No, it, it's a nine to five job kind of. Uh, you know, we wake up in the morning. I think the biggest difference is we do our PT, uh, uh, physical uh, workouts and running and things like that. But I joined uh, administration. So, you know, being a clerk, doing some office work, things like that. While I was in, you know, I noticed, I mean, the military in itself is a whole different community, a whole different world. Uh, and so I began to know, um, learn, it had such a saturation of um, domestic violence, of suicide, of different things like that. Mm -hmm. So me being the person that I am, my energy just naturally attracted people to me who, who needed help. You know, I was that ear to, to listen, to, to provide some empathy and understanding and things like that. So the more and more I did that, the more I just thought, like, this is really something I'm passionate about, being there for people, loving on them, you know, helping them to, to get resources. So then I began thinking more and more about it. Um, and I had a really good chain of command, higher ups who really encouraged me to, to push myself. You know, when I went in, um, I, I began college as, as quickly as, as I could because I know, knew I couldn't afford it um, elsewise. Again, we were a wealthy family. We didn't save or put up for college or anything like that. So I hit the ground running with college, really in, invested there. And so I was able to make a lot of connections with people uh, in the military who really pushed me. And so after I had um, my fourth child, and, and, I, and I say that with, you know, to share with everyone that you can have children and still do what you need to do in life. Mm -hmm. So um, I, was, I was married throughout my military career, didn't have my fourth child. And then I realized, you know what, I want to even do something more. So here I am going through this, looking at the different uh, needs within the military. And I said, hmm, I think I want to do something greater than the criminal justice uh, degree I have obtained in the military for my bachelor's because I wanted to go beyond being a probation officer or things like that I was looking at, especially having children. So I was just looking, I was just Googling one day and I was like praying about it. And then social work popped up and I was like reading it and I'm like, hmm, this is crazy. Like this is everything that I am. Everything that I've been doing, I just haven't been getting paid for it. I haven't been like, I don't have the title of it, but like, this is me, you know? So really clicked. I feel like it's a natural career path for me and something many of us embody may not know it, but social work has been around for such a long time, you know, since um, I believe like 1898 um, was when the first class, you know, started with social work. But it's because of what I just shared of the need of you know people just being observant, realizing, wait a minute, things are disproportionate. There's some inequalities here. Why uh, are some people getting resources and some not, even though right. they're both wanting them? Right. Why is this person's issue with domestic violence being more ignored than this other person's? You know. Um, so yeah, that's that's really caught my attention, and I began in two thousand nine my master's in social work. Very good, excellent. All right, so let's get into the meat and the potatoes of uh, mental health. <clears throat> excuse me, and mental health awareness, and um, why it's so important, and especially today. Uh, let's talk about um, dealing with depression and, and the increase of cases of depression and suicide in the home, especially with young people in high school, middle school, and in elementary school, where I don't know if because of COVID and because of isolation that it has increased, but it's definitely on the rise and definitely something that um, families need to discuss. And I would say, as far as my family, I think that um, there are some things that we probably definitely needed counseling on. But, you know, you're raised to 
just deal with it, figure it out and keep mm -hmm. going. Uh, when I was in college, I was able, they offered uh, counseling for uh, students who may have been struggling emotionally or whatever. And I had a couple of things happen to me in college where I did end up going to see a counselor. Uh, and I think because of the way I was raised, that you got to figure it out, you know, talk to your family about it. You can talk to your parents about whatever you're going through. And the lady was pretty much like, why are you here? But, uh, you know, even in talking to her, if I didn't talk about my struggle at that time, just being able to talk, talk to her about the weather or going shopping, just having someone to talk to was uh, beneficial to me. So, again, let's talk, talk about mental health, why it's important in the increases of uh, depression and suicide. Mm -hmm. well, well, thank you, um, Deborah, for, for sharing some of your story. And, and you're so right. So many suffer with things and they don't know who to turn to. Uh, they try to get help and some, unfortunately, get a response that, that you receive of kind of uncaring and, you know, you know, whatever, kind of suck it up, move on. And that really contributes to de the detriment even further, right, of the struggles that people are going through, you know. Even in 2022, almost 20, 2023 now, I don't feel it's still talked about enough, you know. Uh, I don't. I don't feel that it's seen completely as something normal, as something that everybody should utilize. You know, we don't complain about needing to go to the doctor. You know, we don't really have an issue with that. But then, when it comes to mental health, it's still a touchy subject. Still labeled as the word that I, I don't use, but use it for emphasis here. It's crazy as you know, a uh, personal you problem, something that you created, and, and that's not the case. So there is still a lot of shame around it, you know, to, to speak up. And what you said about that counselor really sticks out to me because that's why it's so important to, to have experience. And not experience just college-wise, um, because it's like, okay, great. We can get all the degrees in the world, but that really doesn't mean anything unless you genuinely want to connect with people right. and you have experience yourself. And so that's why I shared at the beginning, really why recruits recruit from, you know, impoverished areas there because they see that they have a heart often that they're humble. They, they want to do better. They understand um, the hardships of life. But when you don't, um, have a counselor in that way, it's very hard. I, I've worked with counselors who straight out of college, no life experience, never had really much a hard day in a sense in, in their life, or even trying to mingle with people who have, trying to have those conversations with people, going into communities, or trying to get to understand someone of the, a different race, someone of a different culture, someone of a different you know area in the world. Um, so that really um, contributes to if you're going to get a good response. Besides right. that, though, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I had a I had a story to share where yeah, yeah. Um, a, a young lady that I met, um, she had um, a death in her family, and uh, it was her child. And she said, she, you know, she was a teenage mom, and something happened to her baby, and her baby died. So her mother sent her to a counselor. She said the mother paid, I think she said over $600 for one counseling mm -hmm. session. And she said when she got there that the counselor was not someone who she, who she could relate to. She said the lady you know, was not of her same race. Uh, she didn't have any children. And so she felt that it was a waste of her time and money. She said, you know, we would just be sitting here you know, the lady would be asking me questions for me to answer, but she could not relate to my right. culture. Right. You know, the fact that I had a baby and I lost my baby. So you're right in who you choose as a counselor uh, is very important. And I do remember that one of those counselors that, that I went to, I had, I had two different times. I went to one on campus and then I was working at a place where 
I used to answer the phone, which was for the state of Florida in the Capitol building. And I worked in the finance department. We would get all kinds of weirdos calling all the time. Sure. So this particular day, we had a bomb threat. And it was uh, very a very nasty. Uh, the language was very ugly. And I was the person who took the call. So I had to relay it to my boss, who then related to the Capitol Police. And they cleared out the building. And that really disturbed me um, for a while. So they sent me to this woman <laughs> for mental health counseling because I had to take a couple of days off work. So they said, well, before you come back to work, go and see this lady and talk to her. So when I got there, you know, again, culturally uh, different, you know, probably never had to answer the phone on her job a day in her life, um, right. a privileged person, if you get what I mean. Yeah. So yeah. nothing... That I could really, I was like, lady, you just don't understand how mm -hmm. that affected me and not only myself, but everyone who worked there. Right. You know, we literally left the building running for our lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of the way that I was spoken to when I answered the call, and they were they were mad about a check they were supposed to get and didn't get. But anyway, they did eventually find a person. But you know, like you're saying, it's important. Um who you choose as a counselor. And yeah. if you if you are counseling, you don't like that person, you have the right to choose someone else. Okay. I'm yeah. No, no, no. Thank you for bringing that up. You're so right. And I was definitely going to uh, mention that for sure. It's not a one size fits all. That is definitely right. You know, even if the person does have all the experience in the world and what have you, even if the same ethnicity or what have you, it doesn't mean that they're right for you. So many people do get discouraged after that first time, even they don't go back again because they had a bad experience with a counselor, you know, but it's like they say, if you have a bad experience with Walmart, most people are still going to keep going back, you know, because they, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. so it's, it's like, we need to think that way for mental health. You know, we have to just keep trying because it's not for everybody else. It's for us. So you're not hurting anybody but yourself. I mean, I understand why you feel that way it's hard to reach out in the first place. You know, you're so vulnerable and then you're crushed. I mean, many ways people have those medical, medical traumas, you know, and in that way, the, the structural traumas of just continually getting people who are not um, the right fit for them. So that's why it's so important for not only people have experience, for people to look like you, and just to have really a, a plethora of choices to choose from. And we do need more people of color for counselors. We really do. So mm -hmm. uh, all the time, it's just like, you know, a backed up waiting list of people. Really, the first choice is, is someone of color um, to, to get. And, you know, there's more of us now, but still still not enough. Right. Especially in our in our school system. All right, so let's talk about um, church and mental health in the Black community. Our, <laughs> our churches have been our place to go for our mental release once a week. Yeah. And so let's let's dive into that a little bit. Yeah, sure, definitely. And I'll kind of touch on too um, a personal story of mine. So I'll, I'll share with you of that, the Black community the church, and also it touches on even more while, why I, I became a social worker. Um, because as social workers, we think holistically, we encompass all of that. We talk about church, religion, you know, career, where you're living, are you hungry? Because there's no point of talking to someone who's starving and you're talking to them about depression. I mean, they're still going to be starving, you know? I didn't think about that. Right. Mm -hmm. That is important. Okay. So, yeah, that's, that's what puts us, I feel, above um, other professionals in, in the mental health field, because a lot of like psychologists, they look straight at the what they feel is the issue. Oh, you have depression? Let's treat that, you know, but not really encompassing. Okay, let's go through the whole line of things that we need to check out first to make sure uh, there aren't other things contributing, you know, and all the time there is. There are contributing factors to that. But you're right, the black community, most of the time, we look to what? The church first, you know, Jesus will fix it all. And I love these t-shirts going around now that say, I can have Jesus and a therapist. Like, yeah, I mean, you know, 
why wouldn't you want to have more? You know, why not? Hey, make sure you're taking care of all the way. Yes, you can have Jesus and a therapist. A therapist does not re replace God, does not replace Jesus. You know, you, you can have that just like you can have a doctor, just like you have a teacher in school and you have all these other people. So, yes, I believe that we should have a therapist. We should have a counselor at every school, you know, and, and it should be a requirement, especially in high school. It should be a requirement that they check in, you know, every so often, um, once a month or whatever it is, because we know, especially in high school, you go through a lot. Most aren't prepared for their real world once they leave. Right. And so there's there's a lot going on with childhood things. But right. the, the Black community is unique in that way. Um, again, of I have to talk to God first because if I don't, you know, there's something wrong with me or I am, you know, defaming my family. I'm speaking bad against my family. I'm disrespecting my mom or my dad or whomever. So I can't let other people know. So I might as well, you know, go to Jesus. It'll be between me and him. And parents promote that. Don't talk to your friends about things that go on in our family. You know, don't talk about that stuff. I know, I know that's the way I grew up. You know, not to ever talk bad about your mom. Don't do that. You know, I grew up in a single parent um, household and, you know, your mom's working two jobs, doing everything that she can. You can't, you can't say anything at first to that or anything that I think conflicts with how I'm trying to make our family look, right? So a lot in the black community is still focused on the look of the family instead of the true wellness of the family. And that's depicted in, hey, the clothes we wear, right? We got the Jordans, we got the flashy car, we got the chains, we got all this dressed up. How many pastors say, but messed up, right? Dressed up, but messed up. Uh, yes. So, you really, know what, you know what I think? Mm -hmm. I think in dealing, you know, with our community, let's talk culturally here, as we were, that it's the embarrassment that comes with uh, having to admit that something is wrong with you, perhaps, and you need counseling to to make it through or to figure it out mm -hmm. you know, why can't you figure it out you know why can't you just mm -hmm. go to jesus and pray and right. let the lord do it and it has it's been like that for centuries with black people and like you say you can have jesus and a counselor too it's okay to not right. be okay and, and go and get the help that you need instead of terrorizing your family um you know get the help really that you need. It's the first step you have to do is admit that you have a problem. Oh, yeah. That's the hard part. And say, oh, hey, I need you. help. You know, or if your family your family says, hey, I'm going to call these people on you because something is wrong with you and you need some help. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, you know, and then they get mad. Of course, okay. you know, they don't they don't, don't want to admit that they need the help that they right. need. And the last thing, as a last resort, a lot of people do is call the police. Call the police on the person, and God knows what will happen. Yeah, Men with mental issues, they don't need to be locked up in jail. They need right. They need to be killed. They need mental health professionals. And I hope, uh, especially in the city where I live, that they have mental health professionals to show up on those calls and just sending the police to taste people, throw handcuffs on them, and throw them in jail. Right. And I think oh. our communities will be better off if we do embrace mental health in our household. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and all that you mentioned, Deborah, really is a cocktail of grooming people for abusive relationships. Yeah. Keeping it inside, taking it, not saying anything, thinking it's your your fault. You got to pray harder. You got to do better, you know. Um, it's always changing the bar. Okay, you did better here. Now you got to do better here. Nope, it's over here. Nope, it's over there. And that, I believe, personally and professionally, um, know that it really lines you up for unhealthy, abusive relationships. And that's really what happened to me. And mm -hmm. I was in an abusive relationship, you know, for eight years. Might as well say 10. It took me two years to get a divorce because uh, that person didn't want to let me go. But you know, I was always jumping through hoops, always thinking, what's wrong with me? Okay, I need to study harder. I need to get another degree. I need to get another job. I need to get a better house. 
Um, I need to look better. I need to work out more. All of these things because this is how my brain was wired. Now, yeah. you know, it's not like my mom um, raised us and said, hey, I'm going to raise my daughter to be abused. That's, that's not the mentality, right? And that's not what we're saying. We're not saying that parents um, intentionally, and I mean, some, you know, blatantly don't care and do, but most parents, I would say, uh, try their best with what they have and with what, you know, that they, they try to work with. Uh, but when, yeah, you are told to keep all of that inside, it becomes normal. So right. when you get into a relationship where your needs aren't being met, <clears throat> you're being taken for granted, you're constantly feeling like you're just um, out of energy, on e uh, uneasy, walking on eggshells. Well, a lot of these feelings are what you felt when you were a child, right? Mm -hmm. And so our body is naturally attracted to what we're accustomed to, what we're used to, even if it's toxic. So that's why therapy is so important in the black community because we face so many things, uh, inequalities on top of our childhood, you know, racism, um, vicarious trauma. And I want to touch some on vicarious trauma, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, vicarious trauma, I think, is something that many don't know what that is. And it's so important because you could be watching the news and tomorrow get up and go to work and wonder why all of a sudden you're in tears in the bathroom or yeah. wondering why you all of a sudden go off on someone. It seems like suddenly. But it's built up and built up and built up by watching our brothers and sisters get killed by police, by watching them, yes, even kill each other. But that's a whole different story to even get into the why of that. Um, but overall, we're, we're taught to, to hate ourselves, to hate each other, and that, that other people hate us as well, you know? And we're seeing this on the news time, in, uh, time again, day in and day out. Um, and like you, you know, shared, even though you were more involved in that situation, actually answering the phone. But even if you weren't there, let's just say at your job that day with a bomb threat and you heard about it and then you went to work the next day. I mean, and, and you were shaken by it. You know, that's, that's vicarious trauma, something that you know could touch you. So every day someone black wakes up in their skin, they, they have to face these things. So that's why I feel even more, yes, we, we do need, therapists throughout the black community. We need to get in touch, you know, grandparents. I know you didn't grow up that way, but it, times change. You need to really support your family in that way. And you're never too old yourself. You can be 90 years old and still That's need right. therapy. That's right. That's right. And you know what the, um, that you mentioned, you said vicarious trauma. And I think about our children that are small kids, sixth grade and younger, yeah. who experience trauma every day by the music they listen to and it's yeah. not their choice, it's what's played in front of them, uh -huh. the violence that they may see in their households. And it, even going to school, like the little kids that walk to school um, not far from where I live, the, the people that don't even obey the, the uh, school zone, 20 miles per hour, they just zoom through kids walking down the street, just pass right by them and no accountability. Now in other neighborhoods, you better not speed uh, when mm -hmm. kids are walking to the street with a ticket, but our neighborhoods and mm -hmm. I, 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 I say when you take those children and then you, you know, they go to high school, middle school, and then you just put them out there in the workforce or you yeah. send them to these, you get a scholarship, they're done good in school, you send them to these schools who don't have your culture in that school. And so some of that trauma, I think, comes out. And I know some people who grew up here, they went off to college, they went to these schools, and then they didn't quite fit in. And, and, and it just didn't work out well for them yeah. emotionally because there was nobody there that they could relate to. And because of the things that they seen and heard. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even mention the shootings uh, that take place almost every day, the gunshots that they hear every day that other people's kids don't hear in their neighborhood. Right. 
a lot of people don't take that into account. And so again, your, the mental health starting early with your children um, is very important. And, and again, uh, I want to ask you, so if you notice something, even with yourself, how does a person get started into getting uh, mental health help? Mm -hmm. Well, hey, I would ask everyone, how do you get started in um, playing a video game? Which video game do you want to play? You know, speaking about children, the internet is at our fingertips, but we're, we're thinking about other things that are often used as avoidance. Um, we need to talk about that even more. Why are our children on the video games for hours a day? You know, why are our children listening to this music for hours a day? A lot of it is avoidance of, of the, the realities. And so, hey, Google it. Google counselors in my area. It's, it's going to pop up. Guarantee you, like anything else you, you'd want to find. There's so many resources out there um, to, yeah, to, to search and to look into. But for me, I came across, I used to be a uh, director of the Vet Center in Chattanooga here in Tennessee and of Foxville. Uh, it's a veteran center that helps veterans get through their traumas. PTSD is, you know, the top, um, you know, challenge that we help them to work through. But Vet Centers for Veterans, um, I left my job there because I felt that there needed to be more flexibility for the clients to have instead of just coming to the office and having this one standard and this one thing. So I came across better help betterhelp.com and I became um, a counselor on there and they really you know spoke my language and spoke the client's language of uh, you can do video you know just like we're doing here you can do telephone you can do what they have uh, even chat sessions so chat sessions you can literally see each other a text box comes up and we type in real time or text in real time and most people love that because we do that every day anyhow mm -hmm. there's a really good method to really deeply, deeply process. You know, you, you wouldn't think so, but once you get started, it's like, whoa, people start opening up and it's, it's awesome. So those things like that, that are out there, um, there's so many and within your community, um, even hospitals. So if you feel that, you know, you need something right then and there, go to the emergency room. Right. I feel that's better if you have like a family member or a friend take you instead of calling 911. Now, if you need to call 911, hey, by all means, if it's, you know, right now, I, I need somebody, I can't even get in the car to go to the hospital, by all means, do that. You know, call call them and, and get the help you need. But I would first encourage, if you can, to call a family member or a friend. And that's often what I would do for clients, to say, okay, get your family member on the phone, your friend, whomever, can they drive you to such and such near you, you know, and, and get the help, yeah. Um, if you're at school, talk to a school counselor. They're not up to the expertise as we are, but they know the resources in the area. They know how to get you in contact with further services. So kids out there, you know, talk to that counselor. Let them know, hey, it's not a 911 thing, but I'm really being challenged right now. And I want somebody to, you know, talk to on an ongoing basis. So I think that's where, where you can start. Very good. All right. So as you said, you're in, uh, you're located in Tennessee for mm -hmm. the people who are in that area who might want to get in touch with you, maybe become a potential patient. How do they uh, contact you to, um, you know, maybe start counseling with you? Yeah. You can go to betterhelp.com and quest me. Um, my full name, Kayleen McSwain, then hyphen Faulkner. Um, if not through there, my office phone, 423-225-4840. And then also my email is homerecoverytherapist at gmail.com. Those are all ways you can contact me. The email and the phone number are, are more direct than the BetterHelp, but I, I do both, BetterHelp and some counseling outside of that. And then also some really great numbers I want to mention. It's a suicide hotline. So 1-800-273-TALK. 
or 1-800-273-8255. That's a suicide hotline. They also have the lifeline. It's there available 24 hours as well, and they're 988. So if you just call 988, the lifeline gets you. Or if you want to go online, if you want to go online to the chat, then it's 988lifeline.org. And they also have a chat feature there that you can access online. And let me get, uh, you say 988lifeline.org. Uh -huh. Okay. And then it's home recovery. Is it therapy or therapist? Therapist, P I S T, at okay. gmail.com. Okay. So I'm going to put that on there. Okay. So y'all yeah, reach out to her, home recovery therapist at gmail.com. Send her an email, let her know that you enjoy uh, watching. And then if you are in the Tennessee area or you know someone in the Tennessee area yeah, that might need to talk to someone, you can um, send her an email and she'll tell you how you can uh, schedule a session with her. And uh, you said 988lifeline.org. Mm -hmm. We have a couple more questions, though. Yeah, please. Because experience, um, nine eight eight lifeline dot org. Okay, let me put that on there now. Oh, so I wanted. Um, I know in uh in our pre interview, you used to do home visits. Okay, and could you um tell us how? some of the experiences that you had and I brought that up to you because at the time uh you know my dad has a uh, um people to see to his medical needs at this time and the uh, person who showed up was just in awe of his home and I was asking you about some of the experiences you know when you're going to somebody's home other you know as opposed to being in an office or talking to them online is a totally different experience so if you don't mind sharing some of your experiences with doing home visits. Yeah, sure. And um, I'll share that and also touch on even more about depression because it kind of coincides with what you asked earlier. But going to the home is definitely a totally different experience. It's just something that um, I love to do and, and I would do it again when, when and where needed. But going to the home, you see a deeper meaning of mental health. And what I mean by that is you see where mental health is uh, an issue. You know, most of the homes that I went into were not livable. I would have to say up to my standard or what I think and how someone should live. That doesn't mean that's how they should live, but that's how, how I feel about it. And I say that because when I would make reports back to how the home looked, for example, I went to a home where there were dirt floors, okay? And this was in 2015. It still had dirt floors, yeah. Wow. There were flies everywhere. The kids were walking around with no shoes on, and it wasn't the greatest. Every time I left that home, I had to change my clothes. The smell was, you know, drenched in my clothes. Wow. And that, by their laws and policies, um, was okay, as long as they had a roof over their head and they weren't being physically abused, you know. So that is the lowest, I feel, uh, standard of home that I experienced. I've experienced homes where people didn't want to be bothered, uh, didn't want you to interrupt their lifestyle that they felt they wanted to live, so they would hide the kids up in the, the attic. And I'll have to tell them to come down. I have to check you. I have to make sure you're safe. I have to make sure you don't have any bruises and things like that. So those are most of the experiences I've had in the home. There's been some where the home, you know, has been has been good. But, you know, we're called for a reason. Let's just put it that way. So when we're called, you know, we, we meet the, these conditions and very depressing situations. You know, some of the kids seemed happy because maybe they were, you know, didn't know any anything else. Right. But they they didn't have what, what they needed fully. So yeah, but the depression 
is a huge thing. And I often say depression, more and more cases I see with depression, it has to do a lot with suppression. Keeping things in, not living life the way you want to, living life the way you think other people want you to, you know, and that's the black community, again, that's heavily tied to religion, you know, right. and feeling like they're stuck and they can't do anything else than what mom or dad or uncle or aunt, whomever says that Jesus says that they should do. There are some positives of religion and, you know, giving you hope and, and fostering you to, to persevere and things like that. So we have to have some balance in everything, you know, right. so really gaining that knowledge is so important. That's why I think education is so important. Not only education in the schools, but also educating yourself outside of the schools, reading as often as you can. And so I would encourage children to do that, you know, especially our teenagers. I know you don't want to sit down all the time, read, try an audio book, try, you know, watching a video on YouTube that's educational, but the more you know the freer your mind can be, the more you can pull yourself out of your situation. Right. So I would heavily, heavily encourage that because statistics show the more you read, the less likely you are to stay in an abusive situation. You know, the more education and knowledge you get, uh, the less likely you are to stay depressed, uh, at least to the level that you are and things like that. And so we have to stop waiting for a feeling because another, another thing about press. Um, you don't have to wait for that feeling. You don't have to wait for motivation. I say, get your backpack of anxiety, get your backpack of depression and whatever else and take a step forward. You don't have to completely drop or have all that stuff fall off for you to make some progress. You know, I think that is um, a myth there that people think I have to completely be healed or get rid of all of this for me to take a step forward. And you don't. That you take a step forward and a step forward again with those heavy bags and as you go out there and, hey, I'm apply for this job or, hey, I'm going to study for this test so eventually I can get this grade and get a scholarship or whatever. Just keep right. taking those steps the best way you can, even with depression, anxiety, everything else. Take that emotional mind, I say, and balance it with a reasonable mind. And that equals what we call wisdom when you use your whole um, brain there and you can yeah, succeed in anything you, you do. Just keep taking a step. Absolutely. I, th I had one other question. Sure. In, in how you deal with, um, I don't want to call people weirdos. You know, that's my word. <laughs> but um, for you as a female counselor, uh, when you're counseling men and then they kind of go, uh, where they shouldn't be going, how do you deal with those types of, of people? Right. And, and I, I know exactly what you mean. Because yes, I've had experience, but I want to touch on for other people really quick, the weirdos right. or, or crazy or things like that. I, I tell, tell my clients that you all are the most sane people to me because you're reaching out for help. Mm -hmm. To me, the weirdos and the crazies are the ones that I don't think they have any problems. Right. <laughs> We all have problems. We all have issues of some kind. So to me, the the yeah, crazy ones are the ones just sitting there thinking everything's fine and I don't need any therapy or what have you, you know. Uh, I know you didn't mean it that way, but I just wanted to give yeah. me, a, you know, that, that brought that up in my mind to kind of share. I think it's, it's, it's you know, uh, neat. I always mention that. No, the weirdos are the ones not in therapy. But I do, um, yes, get some who have uh, messaged me on Facebook, who have um, asked me where I live and all these things, you know, and thank God for my husband, because we know that's just not going to go down. <laughs> my husband and the dogs. <laughs> my husband and dogs, that's right. I have three, three dogs and a husband. So. They are, all and, of them are huge, so. <laughs> all of them, and, and, like, and God, so hey, we got that too. But um, I, you know, just... I'm straightforward, but, you know, stern, but polite at the same time. Uh, you know, this is inappropriate. I'm here for therapy. I have had to drop some people who continue to do that. I can't be a therapist anymore, you know. Right. Um, but if I get some that will say, I love you, but they'll say it in a way of not just, you know, I love you for being my therapist. And I'll just kind of brush over it and keep talking about therapy. But if they keep going there, then then I'll say something. So that's how I, I deal with that. Like, I appreciate, I understand. It's a natural thing. I'm here helping you. I'm probably the only one listening to you, you know? So, hey, I don't knock you. 
but hey, I'm married and I'm a therapist and we get, you know. I got yeah. a story. <laughs> I had this guy who was dating an, uh, was a freshman or sophomore, my roommate, right? And they were having some issues and then he would call, but she didn't want to get on the phone. And so he would go into this spill about, oh, she did this, she did that. And he just wanted somebody to talk to, right? So me being the listener that I was, um, I just let him go on and on and on. So one day he called, told her the phone was for her. She didn't want to get on the phone. I was like, hey, she's not coming to the phone. And he said, I just had something that I need to tell you. He said, I fell in love with you. I was like, what? And I said, well, you know, uh, that would be weird. You know, I, the the affection was not returned from me, but because I took the time out to listen to him because he was, he did so much for her. Mm -hmm. And then when she kind of just shunned him and cut him off, mm -hmm. it affected him mentally, emotionally. And he really just wanted somebody to talk to. Mm -hmm. I was like, hey, maybe you should go see the school counselor, but I'm right. not going to be talking to you no more. But, you know, that was just really, uh, it was a strange experience for me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how I would handle that these days if that were to happen, which is very unlikely. But again, because I, I had a listening ear for him, he was like, there you go. There you go. You. I was like, I only met you in person one time. Right. What are you talking about? I tell, I tell you what, we, we all become, you know, succumb to kindness in some ways where it just touches our heart because unfortunately we need more of that, you know? So like it's, like I said, it's understandable how people would feel that way because, yeah, you did listen to him. You were there. You know, you took the time. And time is the most valuable thing that we have. Right. So, yeah, he, he was attracted to that. And, hey, he, he's human, right? But you have to let him know. That's weird. Um, yeah. No. And so you have to set boundaries. That's one big thing that, you know, I talk about therapists time and time again. You got to set boundaries. You got to say no to people. And you've got to say no to yourself. You know, you right. got to say no to, oh, I really want this shiny new thing, but I should because I'm saving for X, Y and Z. Or I really want to go and, you know, hang out with this friend, but I can't. because I'm so exhausted. So setting boundaries with ourselves, with other people, you know, is I'm glad you brought that up. But you're, you're on point. It's really contributes greatly to having good mental health and unwanted attention. Like, OK, no, uh, uh, mm -mm, not for me. Thank you, though. Thank you for the compliment. Right. All right. So I'm going to run through the comments again right quick. Um, okay. Mrs. Hall said, good job, ladies. And mm -hmm. she let us know that she was watching. Thank um, you. Dolores Trapp said, awesome advice. Good job, ladies. Thank and you. Uh, Gary Hall said, great information, understanding what's going on. All right. So thank you guys for your comments. And then we'll probably get more comments. Um, as we wrap up here, uh, please like and share the video. We're going to rerun this thing all next week and probably the week after. So uh, you can reach out to Kayleen uh, at home recovery therapist at gmail.com. Again, home recovery therapist at gmail.com. And if you uh, need you or someone you know needs mental health, how to get started or how to find a counselor, go to 988 lifeline.org and i think you said you can dial 988 from your phone right that's Get correct somebody okay so are are there any last comments that you wanted to give before we sign off um i forgot to mention my tiktok at uh oh, dr okay. dr spirit yeah that's my tiktok okay. Hold so on. I did let, some TikTok. let me put that on the screen <laughs> and she does have a, i'm not on tiktok but i do see you know we get um texts from your husband sometimes with all <laughs> kinds of TikTok links and I see where you uh, put them. Uh, well, actually, I'm sorry. I, I correct myself. I think it's Kayleen Spirit. Mm -mm. Yeah, look at it. Look uh -oh. It's at Kayleen Spirit for you. Uh -huh. okay. mm -hmm. So that would be the at sign. Other than that, no, thank you, um, you know, for having me on. It's been a really great pleasure. Love talking about mental health. And I could I go on I, and on and on. I hope I spelled TikTok right. Hold on. Is that right? Yeah, you did it. You did it. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I think it's nope. I think it's C. Oh, oh I'm, look, I'm lying. Uh, oh. 
One of them is a T. Look, I got to look at my thing now. I got to go back. Is it? Or did you do it right? Is that right? I don't know how to spell okay. it. Okay. <laughs> T-I-K-T-O-K. That's what it is. Okay. That's right. Let me put that back. Look, okay. I'm like, the people know. that They know. It's on TikTok. Let's go. Okay. Uh, Kaylee, find her on TikTok, y'all. And then she's on uh, Facebook, too, as Kaylee Spirit. I don't know yep. if you have. Um, yep. What is it? Um, uh, Instagram. Oh, yeah. I don't really go on there too much. Okay. Mostly, yeah, Facebook and TikTok. Okay. So let me go back. We do have one more comment. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Hall says she will share mental health. Help is so needed today. Amen to that. Mm-hmm. Well, this has been fun. Um, yeah, it was. I want to invite your husband on, but we might have to pre-record his interview <laughs> just in case I have to go in there and edit. And it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, hey, I, I have to give a shout out because, yeah, he helped me kind of, you know, talk through some, some of these things for today. So he, he did a great job. Yes. That's, so, that's um, excellent. And kiss the baby. For, kiss all of them for me. Uh, so sure. We'll get that way someday soon. Okay. Hopefully. We will. Sooner than later, hopefully. Yes. Yeah. So we'll look forward to it. The best time, time of the year to come. Mm-hmm. Uh, not so beautiful out yet. here. Yeah. And you get to experience the changing seasons and everything up here in good old Tennessee. So, hey, I forgot one more thing, and then I'm going to get off here. If you are interested in uh, coming on for an interview, um, let me put that on the bottom. My email is on the bottom. If you ever want to come on for an interview, it doesn't matter where you are. You can be in Alaska, wherever. Um, I would like to bring you on for it. For a what I call an in studio interview, which is live like it is today instead of pre recorded, um, just hit me up. Follow us on Twitter at Gospel FL, and that's the South Florida Gospel News. Kayleen, I want to thank you so much again. This has been a lot of fun, and I would like to bring you back on another time. And when you talk to your husband, find out if he feels like coming on to talk about um, whatever. Oh, he does. listen, you don't even have to ask a question. You already know the answer is yes. <laughs> yes, I love to um bring him on, you know, whenever his schedule permits. We can do okay. live or if you record or whatever. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you so much again for coming on talking about so something so important. You know, just like your, ment- your, your physical health, your mental health is more important because actually your mentality controls the physical, right? It's more important than taking care of your car. We do maintenance on our car, but not ourselves, right? So that way. That's right. Absolutely. All right. So thank you again for joining us. And thank you, everyone, for watching South Florida Gospel News. We're going to say bye to Kayleen. Bye. Bye. (laughs) And uh, I do have a couple of announcements uh, that I need to make before I get off here. And thank you, everyone, for watching. I will be very, very brief. So next Saturday, all roads, all of them, lead to Tampa Bay for the 8th annual Tampa Bay Gospel Awards. And they're going to kick it off on Thursday, November 3rd. All right, there are your panelists. Now, this is going to be on Facebook Live, and I'll be sure to show to share the um, live kickoff to my social media pages. And then also, the uh, Tampa Bay Gospel Awards are next Saturday, November 5th at 6 o'clock at the Center for Manifestation in Tampa, Florida. So all roads, all of them lead to Tampa. And I'm proud to say that the South Florida Gospel News is nominated for Gospel Media of the Year again. We were nominated last year, and guess what? We won. Yay! So I'm looking forward to it again. It's just a blessing to be recognized for the work that we do out here not just in the gospel community, but in the community. And I want to thank uh, Mr. Gerard Holmes for putting this together and 
for all of the people out here in the world who voted for us last year that made us a winner. And those of you who voted for us this year, whether we win or not, I really, really appreciate you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much. It feels like my voice is going for some reason. Anyway, I have enjoyed today's session. Looking forward to more. I hope in 2023, I'll be able to do more. Um, I own the platforms. I can do whatever I want to do, right? Bring on whoever I want to bring on, right? Right. So anyway, please like and share this video. Watch it again and tell a friend. Until next time, y'all have a good day and I'll see you later. Bye.